specifically to to act an alert, but I haven't had a so lot of So you would like reply in the text message acknowledgement and like you would basically <coughs> the same thing as acknowledging it in the web. Yeah, what I was using was like uh, an API from push push it push over, I think. Okay. And so it was a little easier to get the response that way. Because I think it's all So does anybody have any questions on like the template configuration file? How it relates to the services and the post checks? So that's that. Uh, we'll go ahead and jump down. Uh, this is the time periods. Uh, this is kind of what uh, it's called out in the templates. You can also individually <coughs> have you know these five service checks that we do on a bunch of different hosts so mm -hmm. create a template this is when I use that with that host just do those five yes absolutely yeah you would make a um, uh, template for it and then on those actual servers under the service definition you just say use and you would call out that template and then at that point you would just fill in the individual information for that host Yeah, templates are, are nice. They can be used for uh, the three main components of Nagios really are hosts, ser uh, host checks, service checks, and contacts. That's like the three main components. Everything else supports those components. Um, so, well, there is well, the plugins and command files, obviously. That's the actual checks themselves, and those are more interesting uh, once, once we get into those. But uh, this is the time periods uh, CFG files. So this is called out. Uh, you can basically set whatever you want. So they have an example of 24-7. Uh, they have an example of work hours, which is from 9 to 5. Um, they have one in here called no time is a good time, which is nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, They actually get kind of elaborate here. So they have uh, U.S. holidays scheduled. So basically it won't schedule you or it won't alert you on holidays. I mean, you can really go and fine tune this um, to what you want and then U.S. holidays. U.S. holidays, it doesn't matter. <laughs> you can put them in there if you want. I mean, but yeah, it's you can really. These are just kind of the examples they give. You can uh, really fine tune it to exactly what you want. It. So, and then basically, you use these the same way you use a template. Basically, you say use, and then the name of the um, one you use at. You can use it in a template. You can directly use it on a service or else. That's the time periods. Uh, uh, host groups and service groups. So this is where you can uh, gather to together hosts and services. Uh, these don't actually define host checks or service checks. Uh, all this is simply doing is basically grouping them for the web UI. Uh, and I'll show you what that looks like. We'll go ahead and jump to that in a minute here. Um, and then how I like to do it is I'll make a configuration file called postgroups.cfg. I'll make another one called servicegroups.cfg to find them all in there. So we'll take a look at what that looks like here. So basically, you give it a name. Uh, the name naming convention here is the same. That's what you use when you call out anything. Uh, you give it an alias, which is the friendly name for the web UI, and then members. So you just type in the members that you want. Uh, and then the same thing for the service group. One slight difference on this is when you call out the members, you call out the uh, server first, so you call out the host definition first, and then you call out the service that you want in that group. So localhost, SSH, Red Hat test, SSH. Um, let's go ahead and jump into here, and I'll show you what that looks like. Uh, so I have very minimal uh, hosts here. I got the localhost, uh, that Nexus, that ping check that I have, and then Red Hat test is another Linux system in Amazon AWS, I basically set to show you the remote, uh, the Nagios NRP, the remote execution of uh, local monitoring. So we'll get to that uh, in a second. Uh, so you can go into your services, you can see these are the services that's checking. So you can go into host groups, and then you can see those two host groups called out. And it'll show you the host groups and all the services on those. 
And then for service groups, you click on that, it'll show you the host groups and only the services that you're checking. So if you had like, you know, 50 web servers and you want to monitor HTTP, you can make an HTTP service group. You can put it, all those members in service in there. You just click on the service groups, you click on the HTTP group, and you can see the status of all of them right there on the page without having to go through all the other items. So it's just a way to organize things. Those groups and service groups are not used to any type of configuration of checks or anything. It's just a way to organize it uh, on the actual web. Right. So here's the plugin. So this is the actual um, core of Nagios, basically. These are the plugins are what do the checks. Uh, so each there are small programs and scripts that run. Um, an interesting thing about the, the plugins is they are all standalone individual plugins. You can run them by themselves. Uh, so let's go ahead and jump in here and I'll show you how to So these are located at <coughs> libexec. So if you go into the user local uh, Nagios libexec folder, that's where uh, by default it puts it. These are what comes with it. I think I added one which is check in our PD, which I'll um, go into in a minute. So these are the actual programs, and if you go into here and say like check load, um, you can see, you know, it says usage, it gives you the usage requirements on it. You can see it runs by itself, so see, um, if you do it on the local system, you can say, uh, so basically each one of them have their own switches. You can actually look into each plugin and help file to see exactly what it can do. So you can set warning. Um, each one of these tends to just be a script as well. Mm -hmm. So if you're like, some of them don't have great output for the help. If you just kind no, of yeah, cap yeah. the file, you, true, yeah. you can get better instructions on that. Do you? Um, have you ever seen one of these scripts or one of these plugins that is used for uh, identifying whether a SIP server is up? A SIP server? Sure. You can definitely have it check that. Yeah, I mean, it, it can pretty, you can write um, any type, you can custom write plugins. Uh, that's the great thing about now. If there's a particular service that you want checked, and there's a way, an external, and even a local way to check it, there's a process that you can run to return something that you know, a status on that, you can write a plugin to do that. Um, off the top of my head, I can't think of one for sp uh, SIP specifically, but uh, oh, I you can definitely do Is there a place where they use like a people to post their own? Yes. GitHub or something? Yes. I'll show you that in a minute. Yeah. It's called Nagios Exchange, and there's a ton of plugins. Also, Monitoring Exchange has a bunch of stuff now, too. That's another one. Seems like yeah. people don't really update Nagios Exchange as much as they used to. Yeah, I did notice it's getting kind of yeah. Have you seen any scripts for behavioral analysis? I have not, no. So you, you mean to check, like what specifically are you looking for? Like, uh, well, um, like an unusual, exactly, okay. unusual business. Enterprise mod has. Uh, I guess it really depends on the use case. The, the, the enterprise product has a lot of different modules for that type of stuff. Yeah, the enterprise one has a, a lot of that built in off the ground. So, but um, I'm trying to think of, of a script. I haven't used a script in Nagios before specifically for <coughs> uh, but, So for this example here, I just did kind of a check load on the local host. <coughs> load average okay. So each one of these you can run individually. Uh, the way Nagios actually uses them is uh, a file called command. Uh, so we'll go into that next. So this is the commands.cfg file. It's located in that same directory. Um, and we'll go ahead and open that up.
does, um, this defines the actual commands that you define in the templates or also in the host or service checks. So basically right here, you say define command, uh, user service, is this going to get into a uh, service? So, this is that one I was looking at before, check local load. So basically what this is, is uh, you create a command line name for it that you can reference in your host and service checks. And then the, the advantage of using an argument or a commands file is that you can put under a command line, you can put the user, uh, check load, and then you can put the arguments. So what this is going to do is you can actually define in the host and service checks what the critical and what the warnings are. So you don't have to type it, you know, instead of putting in the switches manually, it's just right there in the configuration file, you just edit it right there. So that's the point of the commands file. So that user one is Nagios, so it's going to run all these commands as the Nagios user. And uh, so when you get into this, um, basically what you can do is you can pull out that, that plugin. So you type in the plugin name, and then you can put the switches there, and you can put the arguments that you're looking for. You can, if you want, you, if you want like a hard set of lines, and you don't want to uh, call out the arguments in the actual configuration or service files, you can set the actual values right there, and then you just call out that command, and you don't have to set those values. But for most uh, deployments, you'll see it set so that it just has the argument commands on it, so that you can define those, uh, what you're looking for specifically in the host and service checks. Um, so anytime you put a new, let's say you build a new plugin, or you download and install a new plugin, uh, you have to put the associated commands for it in the commands configuration file, or else there's no way to run. Then there's it has a ton of them built in already, so it's got a ton of checks you can do off of that. Uh, you can modify these. So this last one is what I put in. Uh, check in RPE, so you can set host host address will pull from the actual config file you're calling it from, and then you can set the uh, arguments there right in the config file. So we'll, we'll take a look at that in a second. Um, but that's the commands file. So basically, that pulls from the plug plugins. There's, this is that verifying configuration um, that I talked about earlier. So anytime you make a change uh, in service definitions, host definitions, anything, uh, you want to run this before you restart the service. Uh, it's a lot easier to just, you know, put an alias in there. So the alias I have is not use check. And then you can see this is what it does. It will run through all the configuration files on your system. And it will tell you if there's an issue that's going to stop it from running. Uh, it tells you in the bottom here, zero warning, zero errors. At that point, you can go ahead and restart it. Uh, this is very useful, though, because it will catch any type of typo or anything like that. What was the actual command again? Uh, the actual command is uh, basically what you, these are, you can call these out. These are just the absolute paths. So you can call this out anywhere. But basically, what you're doing is from the bin directory, you're running the Nagios uh, then file and the dash V uh, switch there at the top here, that's uh, saying uh, verify. And then you're pointing it to the Nagios configuration, the main configuration file, which ties all the other configuration files together. So basically, it's running the Nagios program in verification mode for this configuration. And you can have multiple, I would suggest that you could have multiple configurations as well that you can check. But this is the default. Yeah, I mean, you run, I run it a lot, so I mean, it's something that you want to set up an alias for. And then when you install it, you can just do a service Nagios restart to apply any changes that you make to it. Um, that's the verification of it. Uh, so before I move on, uh, the next part I want to move on is doing local checks on remote systems. So with the way it's set up now, on this quick overview we did, you can do any type of public service check. So if you want to check HTTP, SSH, anything that's open on internally or wherever, you can check. Now, if you, you want to check local services like uh, CPU usage, memory usage, uh, you have to use, uh, you have to install like an agent on the actual systems to pull that. And that's, that's what I'm going to go into next. Uh, before I go into that, those any questions on the host configuration, services, templates, 
commands, plugins. And the other thing that's nice about the verification, the, the way we have our setup is like we have all the Windows servers in one <coughs> file, which is <coughs> up the wall. Because you add a server, you're copying and pasting, and it'll actually say, hey, this server's in here twice, or yeah. this server's in here, but it has no services. So, you know, it, it, it helps idiot proof you against, you know, the, you the common copy paste errors. Yeah. And that's, that's why I told out here, like, um, a lot of the older uh, installations out there you'll see, do that. they'll put all the hosts in one file and all the services in one file. And that's because in the initial documentation, that's how the Pinagios actually call out how to do it. That's how they recommended you do it, but it's just a nightmare um, trying to manage it, which is why I think it's much easier to just make a single configuration file for each host and then find all your services for that host in that one. And then that way you go to that one file. And then if you want to remove that file, you can just you know do a dot BAK after that dot CFG, it won't process it, it just disappears. Yeah. You don't have to worry about any links between it and that. Um, and then if you need it back again. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, there's, basically, it will read any configuration file you tell it to. So it, it can be, you can design it any way you want, which is the cool thing about it, but also kind of the confusing part about it if you're looking at different installations. So that's kind of the purpose of this, is going through the core components and how they all interact with each other so that you can look at any system and see exactly how they're, you know, what it's doing. So is there, is there any more questions on those parts? So the next part um, is using um, NRP. So NRP stands for uh, Not Use Remote Plugin uh, Executor. Uh, basically, what you do is you install uh, the Not Use plugins on the actual system you want to manage uh, that you want to get the local data from. So it has to it has to run the plugins locally. And then uh, you also install one other program called NRP, and this is the program that's going to listen for calls from the main Not Use server. You also want to install the NRP plugin on the main Nagio server to make these calls to the remote system. Uh, so we'll go ahead and jump in. This is the second uh, system here. So this one right here is my uh, test system. Uh, this is just a base install. It has the plugins installed and it has NRP installed. So it's only doing local checks. So if we go into the same so if you go to the Nagios directory here, you'll see it's only got one configuration file in there, though. It's not running the actual Nagios install, it's just running the NRP. So if uh, you go into this pro configuration file here, the important thing uh, to set in this file is the loud hosts. So by default, it's got the local address in here. Uh, this will only, the NRP will only respond to host that's in, that's, that's set under a loud host. So if we have a <coughs> non system and try to query it for data, it won't respond to it unless it's set in here. So if you put the IP address of your main non server under a loud host and then you open up that port, which you can set from this file, you can put whatever you want. So you kind of want to hide the, the non process. You can, but by default, it's port 5666. So that's basically the main configuration that you do there. Uh, when you install this, you install it as a daemon, so it runs in the background. And then basically what it's going to do is it's going to be listening on that port for uh, calls from the main non-geo system. <coughs> so we go back to the main non-geo system here. We go into uh, So this is my host definition and service definition for See here, I'm defining these services. Basically, instead of um, under check command, instead of just defining like check load, you would put check NRP, then you put an exclamation point, and then check load. Now, if you put it like this with no um, switches at the end of it, what it's going to do is it's actually going to take the local on the machine itself. That it's in the NRP configuration. It's going to take the local switches. Uh, let me show you what I mean by that. So if you go into here again. This is on the remote system. We go down to the commands right here. It, it already has hard coded in here what the warning levels and critical levels are going to be. You can 
chain in here. There is a way that you can directly send commands from the server to uh, uh, the uh, remote host, but they greatly advise against it because you're basically executing remote commands on the system which you don't want to do. So this is basically what this service is doing is it's telling the local service that's running here to run that command locally and return the value back instead of just executing a remote command. So you actually set your, your switches and your, uh, your specifics in the local file, in our PD file itself. This guy. And then as you can see, so the end result of, and then also in the libexec folder, the plugins directory, I had to install the NRP plugin because it's not there by default. So in order to make this happen, I had to install the NRP plugin on here, uh, make that command on the commands file to call out the NRP file, and then I had to install the Nagios plugins and the NRP uh, service on the remote Linux host. So then we're all said and done, you get this. So you get um, the hosts here. This is the test host. Uh, if you go under the services for it, you can see Ping, uh, SSH, this is on the so these are all local things. This is a completely remote system that I'm monitoring uh, from my main and so on. And then so from here, you just build out, you know, for any test that you want or any check that you want that's public, like HTTP, you, can, you don't have to do this. Uh, you can just have it go out there and check it. But if you want local statistics on machines, it gives you a lot more that you can do with monitoring each individual device. We use this for a lot of custom stuff. All of our apps we deploy all have to have an NRPE script where it'll do things like hit an internal debug uh, API endpoint yep. for web services that might verify that <coughs> database connection, Elasticsearch connections, and all that stuff are all up live operating within a timely manner or whatnot. Yeah. And then Nagios hits that API endpoint yeah. every, so, every so many seconds or whatever, cool. and then jumps back and goes, oh, your web app has lost its database connection. So maybe the database server is still up, but something's happened kind of in between yeah. the apps. I'll like, come jump out and go. A common thing we would do is like, so we have a service that's running certain processes, so it's like it's serving up those processes. Instead of just checking the actual, you know, connectivity to it, you actually check to make sure the process is running. The process dies and it alerts me. So it's, there's a lot of cool things to do with it. Yeah. Um, another quick mention, I don't have it set up here, because um, I'm just doing the, free tier of uh, AWS, so I don't have the, the resources on it, but on the on Windows side, there is something called NS Client++ Plus Plus that you can install on your Windows machines. What this basically does is it sets you up kind of an NRP configuration file as well, similar. You can set all that in there. Uh, you can also set up a password too for it, um, so that you can't just pull commands unless it's coming in with that password. Uh, and basically, you can use the same uh, check NRP commands to pull Kind of like an overview of remote management. So this is basically, you know, I just kind of wanted to go over the core components, sure. how they relate to each other. Um, I, I seem to recall because I put NRP in a couple of systems, but thought most of our Linux systems are CentOS, and the RPMs that I used, I had problems with. Like the, I don't know if I ended up with the wrong version or were something. Getting, were, you, were you getting no output detected? I ended up having to blow away the RPMs and, and I think install from source. I just, I, I never figured out what, what I did wrong. I just I, I actually I had an issue started over. When I was setting up this test environment, I had an issue. Uh, let me show you what it was. So going into the NRP, uh, there's a kind of a, a neat test you can do um, just to check. check uh, NRPE dash H for host. Oh, oh, yeah, oh I actually was looking at that.
run this um, check NRP host, and you just define the host, and that you don't give it any arguments, it will tell you what version of NRP that remote system is running. Uh, that, as long as you have connectivity, that usually works. That I've seen where that will work, but there's a lot of other things that work, like the actual plugins themselves are not processing correctly. So this is a good like first check just to make sure you have that connectivity. Uh, once you have that connectivity, what ended up being my problem on here uh, was the NRPE configuration file itself. On the older version, for some reason, they used absolute pass, but on the newer version down here under these check commands, it was not using an absolute path. It was actually using a relative path. And the way it installed itself from source was not structured for that relative path. So all my checks on here were failing because I couldn't find it. So I had to go in here and I just rewrote out the absolute pass on it because that's how it used to be. I don't know why they changed it. And when you install from source, it doesn't, which is really odd because it doesn't follow the, the relative pass that has set. It's one directory out for some reason. So that ended up being the problem I had with it. Uh, but I mean, there's you know, different things. Uh, permissions is another big thing that I've seen a lot of. Uh, if, it's, if the NRP is installed under root and like, the install files, the configuration files are owned by root, sometimes you can have problems on there as well. Uh, that's pretty common for it. So when you, do the, uh, when you do the configure before you compile it, you make sure you configure it with the, uh, the non-EOS group or user. Uh, so NRP can run any of the, the, the scripts that the base Nagios can run? Yes, you have to also install them on the remote system. Well, because I found a script that will just test the login capability on Postgres. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I was just thinking his idea of, well, I've got a remote system that needs to connect to a Postgres database, so I copy that, that plug-in over, and then I can actually test the remote system's ability to connect to the database. Yeah, all NRP is doing is it's the two processes. So you have the, the plug-in running on the one side, and you have the, the service running on the other side. It's basically telling it, you gotta have both the, whatever check you're trying to do, they have both have to be installed on both, and you have to have the command arguments for it. And basically we'll pass it along, and it, as long as it's in the same, you know, it's pointed to the right one, it'll run it the same way, <coughs> return back to the, the configuration, or return back, return back the result. The thing with doing that though is like so like you've got your password for your Postgres in the script for monitoring or whatnot, and this way it doesn't have to know it, right? It just hits something on the app and the app says yes I can talk or no I can't. The passwords are kept within yeah. the app infrastructure. So you're actually awesome. exercising a yeah, piece exactly, of the app. Right. Yeah, which is much, much more better. You want to do. Yeah. Yeah. Than just going like can something log in with this password I hard coded. It does. Uh, Yes. Yeah, I think it's actually even through the browsers and switches. Yeah, they had some switch templates and stuff in his template list there. Yeah, here it is. Yep, it does. It's got a free filter. You don't even have to install it. Oh, um, that's that's, that's, yeah, that's email. Oh, whoops. Sorry. I sent an MPI. Do not uh, check if status is available for just about any device. You can use that to check ports on switches. Oh, check interface, yeah. Yeah. Well, check There's a traffic. Is Do you have to know like the whole like no no number set? Or no. There's actually there's a, a check traffic idea. that's like a probably a third party one that I use all the time and uh, I use it for everything. Yeah. yeah. Uh, a great place to it is get kind of depreciated like what you were saying. Um, unfortunately, some of them is not being updated, but this used to be kind of the place to go for plugins. It's the exchange.nagios.org. And you can basically search in here uh, what you're looking for. And uh, it'll tell you. Dell Open Manage. Yeah. Oh, yes. There's a Dell Open Manage. And then the cool thing, too, is about the plugins is like there's a lot of great guides out there for creating your own. Like what you were saying, like you can monitor this stuff. You can go a lot more in depth than just what's The cool thing about creating it is like 
all you have to do is get that exit code in the right like single line string output and right. you know whatever you did before that.